thank you very much. And my understanding is you're going to be here for at least part of the day and participate uh, so we can, we can sort of try and interact with you more. Uh, I do want to try and move ahead uh, to our next panel uh, on informed consent, which Mark has already highlighted as a key issue uh, that we may have to deal with or rename or dispose of. Uh, Pearl O'Rourke from Harvard University and David Forster from the Western IRB uh, are going to present, and they've coordinated uh, so that Pearl's going to go first and talk primarily on domestic issues and David on the international issues. Uh, Elizabeth uh, Nabel from Brigham and Women's was uh, slate scheduled to moderate this. She's unable to, to uh, be here uh, physically, but is going to try to, uh, uh, to phone in. I don't know if Betsy's on, uh, you're on the line already, uh, but we are. I guess I am, Bernie. Fabulous. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, and uh, so uh, I'm going to actually moderate because in the Q&A, she won't be able to see the cards that go up to indicate you want to speak, but I want to make sure that we give uh, Dr. Nabel, both in this session but in other sessions as well, a chance to, to ask questions uh, of our, uh, our panelists. So uh, let me thank both uh, Pearl and David, and Pearl, uh, we're eager to, to hear your talk. I know both of you have thought and been deeply involved with these issues for, for some time. Is that on? Okay. The red light means on. Okay. Um, you have to really press that. Oh, that too. Okay. Wow. Okay. Uh, it's fun to follow Mark's uplifting uh, talk, <laughs> and I'm going to get more into the the weeds, the practical, um, and I hope these go together. Um, again, as uh, Bernie said, David and I have combined things. Neither of us have anything we want to tell you anything about. Okay. Uh, informed Consent 101, I realize there's a variety of people around the table here, and some of this may be unbelievably basic, but I think it is important that everybody have the same level. Informed Consent, it's a form and a process. It's initial and ongoing. It's not a one-time hit. Um, the IRB has to require certain things in the Informed Consent form, and apropos the discussion here, we have to say how privacy and confidentiality will be protected. So yes, we have to say who's going to have their paws on the data, how it's going to be shared, et cetera. A very basic, important thing to understand is the last bullet. Informed consent forms are too long, too much legalese. They're not understood, and they are most definitely not remembered. HIPAA, I know that you had a separate section on HIPAA. I would just like to point out a few things. Um, obviously, the focus here is on identifiable or protected health information. In terms of informed consent forms, uh, some institutions merge HIPAA language into their informed consent forms. They have a single document. Others, they are freestanding. Um, we have to include a number of details, and many of the HIPAA-required details are absolutely chilling to participants, particularly the issue when we say, these are the people with whom we're going to share it. Once it's outside our hands, we really can't guarantee that, in fact, your privacy will be protected. This, in some situations, will cause someone to walk away from the research, but we have to say that. Yesterday, there was some talk about compound authorizations and compound informed consent forms. Um, I think if there is time in the question and answer period, it would be interesting maybe to get into this, but the bottom line is if you're doing a trial of drug A versus drug B, and oh, by the way, you want have a secondary use for the data, you need an active opt-in to be able to do that. So uh, again, you get into this issue of maybe not everyone would opt-in. How useful would that data be for secondary research? You're right, this is hard. Uh, as you're sitting here, I'd like to have you realize what is already in informed consent forms. Uh, we have to tell people just for the primary study who is going to have access to the information, where it's going to travel, if it is sponsored research, how the sponsor will receive, maintain, and potentially use that data. Uh, Mark uh, very thankfully also showed you the details we have to have in the informed consent form regarding clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, we also have to have details of NIH GWAS sharing if, in fact, the study has a funded GWAS component. And uh, there are many other additional ones. I have a particular registry I want to be able to send to. So we are already on these very too long, 
too often not remembered consent forms. We already have this menu of here's what may happen. And I definitely um, agree with Mark in terms of really to the point of notification rather than is this meaningful consent. In terms of uh, sharing consent, uh, sharing without consent, uh, the top bullet here is a direct quote from your uh, report. Sharing of data without specific participant consent might be ethically acceptable and legally permitted in certain cert instances. The issue here is if you take identifiable information, you render it de-identified, it's no longer a human subject and hence no longer under um, the human subject's regulations. Despite that, the reality is many institutions do not allow that and would only allow that if there were a sentence such as this example uh, included in the informed consent form that tells people we're going to take your identifiable data, de-identify it, and then use it for anything. In many cases, if that's not there, uses well beyond the initial intent of the research would not be allowed. Details for prospective informed consent, many of these were discussed yesterday in terms of what is the data we're talking about, with whom would it be shared, for what, and as we talk about all these details and potentially put thing, putting them into an informed consent form, again, I remind you, they're too long, they're too detailed, they're not remembered, they're not understood. And my final slide, uh, this has already been alluded to. This is a study um, that we did participate in. Uh, in terms of retrospective, looking at legacy consent forms, we try to see it through the eyes of the individual. What would a reasonable person assume that they had consented for? Um, and as we try to look at these, and we it currently is the IRB. I virtually have one and a half people who are looking at retrospective consent forms trying to see what can be shared. This is unbelievably expensive, both person-wise and financially, in that it really takes a pretty high-level person to do these. The forms, as you can see, um, both Barbara and Mark already alluded to this, the ones that are most unbelievable are those that are inconsistent. Data will stay here, except for when it's shared throughout the world for future research. <laughs> I mean, it's awesome. Uh, the thing that is even more concerning is no participant ever picked up on the inconsistency. Again, too long, not read, not understood. I will now turn this over to David, and we have a combined final challenges slide. <laughs> 